So when I came here, I always say that when I landed at Narita Airport, I had two things, my suitcase and a dream. Welcome to the Melanated Files. In this series, we highlight and share the stories of black people from across the globe. Remember to subscribe to this channel for weekly videos and also follow us on social media for regular updates. Let's get into the interview. Welcome to another episode of the Melanated Files. My name is Ranzo and I'm your host and today we're joined by Simon Sakala. He runs an English school right here in Sagamihara and he's also an English teacher. He has a very fascinating story so hang on to your seats. This is like one for the books. Okay, so we're, we're going to get into it right now. Simon, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So please introduce yourself to the world. Ranzo, thank you so much for <laughs> giving me this opportunity. I'm really uh, glad. No oh, yes, um, Simon Sakala, I come from Zambia. And uh, uh, yes, um, three things I like to say. I'm an um, English teacher and I also teach English teachers. And I also help people with um, uh, English school businesses. Or, uh, in other words, I'm also an entrepreneur in that sense. Okay, okay. So the story, listen. Where Simon is right now wasn't where Simon began. He's been in Japan for over 22 years. That's right. A long time. And we're going to go all the way back to the very beginning. So why Japan? Yes, why Japan? That's a good question. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, um, I came to Japan because I, had, I came to join my wife. She's okay. the one who came here first. And the funny thing is that she didn't even want to come here. <laughs> okay. okay. But here we are, we're here. This is uh, 22 years. Yes, my wife came to study and mm -hmm. um, she came to, uh, to uh, study for a PhD. Okay. And uh, Japan, why Japan? Uh, because they, uh, she used to work for the Un University of Zambia and this University of Zambia School of Veterinary Medicine was built for the Japanese government. Okay. And then you, uh, so you have a lot of support, you had professors from Japan here teaching and it happens that she was under one of those professors okay. who ended up, uh, when he came back, so uh, she ended up doing research under him in a university. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So from she started her PhD uh, way back, when was this? What year was this again? Oh, well, she, we came here in 1997. So 1997. She, came, she, was, she came here in April of 1997. Okay. And she was at a school in Yokohama to study mm. language, Japanese, for six months. Okay. And uh, I came six months later. Um, in November of that year, 1st of November, okay. 1997. And, and then she started doing her research in, um, here in Sagamihara. I think you said she never liked it initially. Like, what was the, <laughs> the initial response to Japan um, on her part? Oh, this is, uh, you know, uh, because well, before we came here, my wife went to do her master's degree uh, in, in the UK okay. at University of London. And she wanted to continue with her PhD in uh, in the UK, in okay. fact, she had applied for the Bites Trust, but then her boss was supposed to sign, and mm. he refused to sign. Oh wow! Because he said he wanted her to come to Japan. He had mm. this close relationship with this Japanese professor, and he thought oh, it would be the best if she studied under him. So oh, wow. uh, even before she finished her master's degree, they sent her forms to apply for the PhD program in Japan, and she just shelved them. <laughs> okay. And the second set of forms came, and she didn't do anything. So when we returned, mm -hmm. when she realized that she had no choice, <laughs> she yeah. finally gave in, and that's how she ended up uh, coming here. Coming here right. And the first six months were very hard for her. Okay. She was literally crying sometimes. Uh, the reason was she didn't know anything about Japan mm. and she didn't know Japanese. I mean, um, a lot of things were very different. And uh, um, she said she used to, she kept saying that the life it was very lonely that time okay. and and oh and she has a different story though but <laughs> now she she really likes this place so um, then eventually she got over that but in the end it all worked out right so you guys are here now over twenty two years uh, right. you have kids in Japan yes right <laughs> they were yeah. born and raised in Japan yeah. pretty much as well we always joke that my kids are made in Japan <laughs> <laughs> they're made in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, <laughs> you're made in Japan, right? So six months later, you came here and you met up with your wife in Japan, right? That's right. So what was the experience then for you? What was the experience for you? Tell me about your journey. Oh, well, that was a very <laughs> um, um, interesting um, experience for me. Because when I came, well, before that, uh, you know, I went to, 
to college, I studied civil engineering and okay. I was working as a civil engineer. I worked both in Zambia and the United Kingdom okay. as a civil engineer. So when I came here, I always say that when I landed at Narita Airport, I had two things, my suitcase and a dream. And, okay. a dream. and my dream was, go, was to go to graduate school and okay. study especially structural engineering, yeah. with bridges, because Japan has uh, um, the most one of the most amazing bridges uh, in the world. So okay. I was, I came with that in mind. And um, so I was very excited, but um, to, uh, but what happened was that when I landed, yeah, I found that things were really hard. <laughs> okay, one, a lot of things were different. And when I tried to go to graduate school, I couldn't get a place. One, I had two major barriers, one, was the language mm -hmm. because I needed to get a program that was, you know, in English. Yeah. And very few universities offer programs in English. Okay. And those are very difficult to get in at top universities. So that was a major problem. Mm -hmm. One major problem. The second one was I didn't have money to pay for my school. I tried to apply for scholarships, but I couldn't get them. And uh, especially that my wife was on a scholarship that time. Okay. Some institutions say that if any, any member of your family is on a scholarship, then you're not, you can't get oh, a wow. scholarship. Yeah. So. Um, then I, I was here and I I didn't speak Japanese and I didn't know places here so uh, I was spending my time just in the house cleaning cooking and I tried to watch TV which I didn't understand mm -hmm. and I started learning French on the radio okay. <laughs> in Japanese but what happened was I learned a lot more Japanese than French I Not think French, okay. so then a friend of a friend told me about the job of teaching English okay. and uh, so um, I thought about it I didn't really want to teach English I, I, I really didn't mm. want to but then I couldn't get a job I couldn't go to school so that was the only thing I could do and make some money. So that's how I went, ended up teaching English. Okay. Yeah. And, and you said that you weren't good at it at first. Oh, right. right. <laughs> you said you struggled <laughs> uh, initially. So tell me about how you uh, mastered or got better at teaching. Uh, so tell me about that journey. I was, I had, I was a terrible teacher to say the least. Okay. Um, in fact, what happened was, um, I, when I started teaching, I was given one of the classes was one class of these four year olds. Okay. Um, I think four or five euros, and there were only four kids, okay. I, I couldn't handle them. I mean, I just couldn't do anything um, productive with them. So I was very honest. I went to my boss. The manager said, I think I'm just wasting these kids' time. Mm. I want to quit. Okay. And she said, um, what if we give you an assistant? Can you try? I said, oh, yeah, let's try. So they gave me an assistant who was very a, a very fluent English speaker, a Japanese lady. Okay. And okay. so she helped me uh, with the class, and that's how I survived. Okay. Yeah. All right. So how long did you teach uh, under this uh, institution before you went off on your own? All right. What was that journey like? Oh yes, it's just, um, um, this is what happened. Okay. So uh, after it been because we came here, as I said, because my wife came to study, so uh, everything was like plant so when she finishes we pack and go okay um so in the in but in the meantime i started teaching english which i didn't like then i i later uh, realized that I, I didn't like it because i was incompetent okay. so i started i decided to wanted to learn about teaching and how to be a good teacher and so this then i started learning and um, uh, it was so amazing when i started discovering some of the things um, about children, about teaching children, okay. how children learn. Mm -hmm. So that really, I was just changed in um, my attitude towards teaching English. But before that happened, there was a time when uh, I went for a, a meeting in Tokyo to the, a, a Christian conference, mm -hmm. and because I'm a Christian, that's a very major part of my life, mm -hmm. my faith, and most of the decisions. That was a tipping point, almost. Yeah, yeah. and most of the decisions I make are based on that faith, and okay. of course, consequently, the results that I get. Okay. So I went to this meeting, and this man was preaching about. Uh, he, 
there's a message entitled in the miracle in your house and in that story uh, if you're familiar with the story of uh, Moses in the Bible mm -hmm. he talked about Moses um, given being given the, um, the assignment to take the children of Israel out of Egypt yeah and so Moses when Moses was God he um, he gave excuses he said no I can't speak I'm not fluent anymore <laughs> so God asked him a question what do you have in your hands and he said he had a rod in his hands and he used that rod and, and let it became it, it, uh, it became the rod of God and that preacher after Telling, talking about that story, he turned to us and says, there are some, some people in this room, mm -hmm. you're looking for something to do, and yet there's something that you have in your hands. Yes. There's a miracle in your hands, something that you can do today. And I went, that's me, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to teach English. I, was mm -hmm. always, I, I didn't want to teach English, and I was always thinking about you know, uh, going back to my engineering career. Okay. And uh, then, but... Although I was facing these hurdles, I still was trying to push that me. So that day I decided, okay, I'm going to, to use what the thing that's in my hand. Mm -hmm. So then I had to think about how I was going to make use of that. And I did, when, once I, I, I thought about it, I thought, well, if I became competent, then I'll probably enjoy. And I said, learning. Mm -hmm. And I put, I put myself on a uh, false tape program, say, okay. <laughs> the four stages. Okay. The first stage is to realize what, what was in my hand, which had happened. And then the second one was to uh, become good at what I had, to become a good teacher. So okay. I had to go through the training. And the fourth stage was how could I make that a job, a source of income. Yes. And uh, uh, not just some income, but um, um, I, uh, um, I wanted to have a good enough income, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, which led to the fourth uh, stage, which is like to become the best, to be always at the top, and mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to be at the top of the competition. So I had to go through this process. And uh, by the way, over time, I've developed a, a a model which I call the Eight Arms for Successful Enterprise, okay. which uh, I, I I I talk about in my programs for teachers and entrepreneurs. Uh, so I. After I did that, and I started developing my career, and uh, so I wanted to learn more about children. And then I, the moment I did that, I started discovering some very interesting thing about children. One, I realized that if, most of the things that we're doing, we're wrong things. <laughs> most of the teaching is done in a wrong way. It doesn't really help children okay. to learn. So I've actually come up with. Uh, certain ways of teaching. I had to develop my own ways of teaching. And there were two instances that I had with children that really made me rethink about the way, we, the way uh, I was teaching. One was there was this kid that had come back from Malaysia, and uh, a Japanese kid, and mm -hmm. uh, she was put into a returnees program. These are programs um, where kids that have lived abroad that are fluent speakers of English would go in. And uh, so she was there. And then one day the teacher asked her, he says, how come you speak English very well? I can't. The answer she expected was, I lived in Malaysia. When, but you know what the kid says? She said, because I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, I went, wow. Okay, she says she knows it. This was, she, she doesn't talk about it because they learned it. She says, because I know it. So I said, well, from that point onwards, I thought, okay, if, how can, what can I do in order to make the children know it? Mm -hmm. Not explaining things to them, but if I do things with them in English, they'll know it. And that helped me change my, uh, the way I taught. And then the other thing that helped me uh, gravitate towards children was the other inc second incident I had. Um, so this time I was supposed to do a trial lesson. This is a trial the lesson that you do uh, most most of the time around spring, before, to attract you to show to demonstrate the lessons mm -hmm. to those that want to. Was this one when you were working for someone else? Yeah, I was still working for someone okay. else at the time. Uh, so there was this day, and this ties into the black experience. That's one of them I had okay. with the kids. Yeah, um, and so the, we were expecting I think three kids, but only one showed up. Okay. okay. Um, so, and one class was ready, and 
And the, but what happened was when this kid saw me, when the mother saw this is your teacher, she looked at me and she screamed. Oh, wow. Go away, it was scary. Wow. <laughs> and she clung to her mother. She'd never seen a black person in her life. Mm -hmm. If she had, she'd never close, maybe come close to anyone yeah. at that time. She screamed and she clung to her mother. And I mean, nobody knew what to do. The mother was there, um, a little bit embarrassed. The, the staff was there, not knowing what to do. I was there, mm -hmm. not knowing what to do. Uh, but I had this uh, string bag, a little bag, where which I use uh, when I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. it, it has some uh, creepy things inside, mm -hmm. <laughs> some plastic toys, okay. rubber toys, a snake, a frog, a uh, lizard, and some fruit, and mm -hmm. a plastic toy. So I use this a lot. Uh, um, so I had that in my hand. So I just noticed that she would like kind of and look away. So I raised that bag and I saw that she, she was getting interested in that. So mm -hmm. I opened it and I had no idea about anything about, I didn't have any background um, about this kid. Mm -hmm. okay, I opened it and I pulled out, I think it was a banana, plastic banana, and I mm -hmm. said, I have an apple. And she looked at me and she went, no. <laughs> That's a banana. I said, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. This is a banana, right? I said, yeah. And I said, whoa, actually, I have a lot of things in this bag. Do you want to play? And she came down. Yeah. And because we had lost a lot of time waiting, so the time for the class was, like, lost. But we did that, and it was time to go. Okay. And Guess what happens? She never wanted to leave. She cries, literally. <laughs> she doesn't want to go. Oh, wow. Okay. I went, wow, that was a moment of inspiration. Mm. Okay, so, and that was because it's something that I learned about children, that if they know something, mm. they want to show you they know it. Ah. Okay, and they want to, if they think you, you're done, they want to show you. Okay? <laughs> they want to correct you. Okay, so I used that. Yeah. And so, and the kid, and, and the member, the staff was, she was so, so, I mean, she didn't know what to say. She said, this is Simon Magic. She said, yeah. she told me. Okay. And yes, there was another experience. This has, has to do with children again. And mm. like, how do they, how do kids look at like people, uh, mm. regardless of their race? Um, um, I realized that the first, like that kid's case was the first encounter they have. This, it's, they've never experienced it. So it's, this, that's the reason. Okay. But once they, they know you're a person once they get close to you. I mean, those things disappear. Okay. Can you imagine, there was one time I was teaching with, in this class and I removed my glasses to, wipe, to rub my eyes. And one of the kids looked at me and he, he, he was telling his other friends, says, look, Simon looks like a foreigner. <laughs> so I said, what? <laughs> Why did I become a foreigner? I just after taking off my glasses. I said, what? <laughs> so, you know, because my, you know, I've never really <laughs> yeah. understood that puzzle, but what, that's, intriguing. Th that's what I realized was that, you see, they, they, that thing of being a foreigner or black was, didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And just something... They saw you as a person, as Simon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the fact is, when I take off my, my, my glasses, that's when they can see that my eyes look different from the eyes uh, of the Japanese, uh, okay? I see, I see. So this one, they, he went, ah, oh, it looks like a foreigner. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah, so from that experience, so I, 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 I just um, uh, realized that actually children um, and in every society, they, they, they don't have an opinion, you know, it's what the society gives them. Mm -hmm. All the uh, prejudices, they don't have those. Yeah. So if we, uh, if the kids have the right kind of experiences, the right kind of information, then I think a lot of issues to do with race and ethnicity will not exist as they do in most cases. Indeed. So since we're on that topic, right, about race, right, I want to find out your black experience in Japan. Uh, you can share your wife's experience your knowledge of her experience, as well as your children as well. Mm -hmm. So what has your black experience been like in Japan so far, over two decades? Tell me about that. Okay, um, oh yes, I'll let me talk about some of the experiences I had, some okay. of the negative experiences I had earlier on. Uh, one had to do with my job. Mm -hmm. okay. This was not necessarily about being black as such, but a bit about being African. I, okay. I, um, a friend 
I was working with um, at the YMCA told me about the possibility of another job because at that time I just had a few hours I was working part time mm -hmm. okay. so she told me there was another company in Tokyo that was looking for teachers so I said oh I'm interested and she gave me the details so I went to see um, uh, the owners, uh, the manager in that school mm -hmm. so she, I did an interview but she told me she said you see uh, because you're you learned English as a second language and you know, it, it's not your mother tongue, so mm -hmm. you need uh, to apply effort to speak English. And so um, then she turned me down. Okay. okay, that's how she turned me down. And but from that, what my reaction was? Well, um, it's just that she doesn't. This is what she thinks. It's uh, that's her uh, preferences. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was going to look for someone who is happy with me. Uh, and at that time, I really had. Uh, YMCA was a great place to work, and uh, uh, I think it's um, from that I learned that if somebody turns you down, if you um, or somebody is not happy with who you are, you always find people that are really happy with who you are. In fact, they would be disappointed if you try to change yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's from my experience. So that that was one experience, but I overcame that very quickly because I had um, I, I realized that there were a lot a lot of people that didn't care about that and uh, by the way by in in Japan here you're considered a native speaker of English if you you had 12 years of education in okay. English yeah okay so basically technically I was considered a native speaker of English that's okay. why I got a job in the YMCA and uh, so then the other time was um, uh, so this, um, around, this was around the, the ch ch 2000, my son came. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's one of the experiences. We hadn't, we didn't, uh, it was, we didn't plan to have a kid that time. Okay. And, uh, but like somebody said, the kids come when they want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she was doing research, she was still in the middle of our studies. But um, the other thing that happened was that, when she was 25 weeks pregnant, mm -hmm. she, ex she had membrane rupture okay. and uh, it became an emergency so my son had to be born through cesarean section. Okay, prematurely. Prematurely. Okay. It's just, it's just, just 25 weeks. So, okay. And it was very small, 900 grams. Mm -hmm. uh, now he's okay, <laughs> but he's, he's 19 now. And uh, so that, of course, uh, brought something else um, to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. oh, then maybe um, I'll, I'll get back to the story again, to uh, the, the, the events that led to my son's birth. But what that happened, what, what um, the, um, the way that connects the black experience was that when my son and then later my daughter was born, we used to live in this apartment. Okay. Um, and uh, 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 it was really for students, because we, my my wife used to live, moved there when she was a student. Okay. So it's not like a family. It was small. It was small, and yeah. even soundproofing was okay. very bad. Yeah. And so we live. We used to live on the second floor. So uh, when my kids were one and two, they would when every morning when they get up, they would run around the house. So the neighbor downstairs didn't like that. Yeah. And so she would come to complain, um, and they just say, "You move, find the goes." somewhere else or you can go to the park and play and because I want to sleep because she used to work from evening to late night and she'd okay. be sleeping that time so because of that we had to look for a different apartment oh, yeah wow. and then we went to real estate agents around the neighborhood and most of them were saying that the owners of the houses didn't want foreigners okay and some actually were very bad I doesn't remember one office where we went he was even not even looking up at us when he was saying it oh so, wow so, yeah but, and it was hard, my wife was crying, mm. um, trying to find a place. And then, um, fortunately, through my... The this is when the kids were young. Yeah, they right? were young. Yeah. Very young, And okay. so, we co I, I, I got information that there was a place that, w that would deal, the real estate agent that was dealing with foreigners and students. Okay. And then we went there, and very, very nice people. And mm -hmm. they helped us find a bigger, nicer apartment. And with the choice, we chose the first floor, so they didn't have to disturb anyone, and there were other families living in that. Okay. And it was very good, very good. We had a very good uh, contract. So that was one experience that was really hard. But after that, like I said, later on, we found people that were happy with 
us <laughs> and they were very helpful. So that was um, um, uh, what happened. And for my kids, I think, of course, they have the regular you know, comments from other kids, you are dark, you um, but we, I just help them to think about that and to how to handle that. Okay. Them, well, if somebody says you're dark, you are. So why? It's just that you're different. Just that in this country, like so why? <laughs> in this country, there are more people that are dark. But if you go to a different country, like if you go to Zambia, you find that more people are yeah. black and yeah. the very few people are light skinned and they, they experience the same kind of problems. Okay. okay. They also uh, called different kinds of names in most cases. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember we uh, kids calling white people albinos. Because, oh, I see. Yeah. So I said, "Whoa, this happens. It's just ignorance." And so, um, and they were able to through that. It took time, and yeah. they were able to handle those uh, comments without any yeah the issues at more now. They're okay yeah. with that. So. You said also that you went to your kids' school as well to volunteer to kind of get the their classmates familiar with you or something like that. Oh yes, yeah, and this is I think this is a very uh, it is very uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was when I because um, uh, I knew that my kids would have these problems, so what I did from when they were very small, I always. Uh, tried to get into the schools or institutions wherever my kids were and mm -hmm. I helped them, you know, handle. For example, when they were in um, daycare centers, mm -hmm. the daycare center, I volunteered to teach English there. Okay. And because the kids loved me, they loved the, the lessons, and so they ended up liking my kids. Because wow. like, you know, saying, oh, he's there, they're his children, you know. So my kids, and the self-esteem for my kids was like, I improved. So I did that for uh, nursery and elementary school, middle school, even in high school, whenever there was an event uh, where I could participate, I made sure I was there. Yeah. And uh, it turns out that in most cases, my kids would be the only black kid in the school. Okay. And I think in elementary school, the closest they got was, was this two siblings who had mixed parentage, the mother okay. Japanese and the father was from, I think, Nigeria. That was the closest. Otherwise, uh, junior high school, okay, there was another one like that, but high school, uh, completely no, nobody else. Okay. Like so. But they've, they have had um, a very good time. They never came back with any complaint. They never came back and said they don't want to go to school. Okay. And because of that um, involvement in the school, and I, uh, uh, just volunteering to participate. Yeah. You are very proactive. Yeah, 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 and that really helps my kids. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. What about your why? Just briefly, I know that uh, you're just going to speak on behalf of her, but just a little bit. What has she articulated um, about her experience being a black woman in Japan? Just briefly. Well, I think apart from that, that issue of the kids, I think she, um, mm, there isn't any kind of outstanding experience okay. as far as I can remember. Yes. Okay, so currently she works with you at the schools, right? Uh, yeah, she works with me at the schools and also she teaches in the uh, middle schools in okay. Yokohama. Yes. Okay, yeah. so we're going to get into that now, right? So right. guys, so we're going to get into some miracle stories, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to call them that because when he shared the stories with me and how we started the school, you guys will see what I'm talking about. So I guess we maybe can start from the apartment right and then we can move to when you started the school right transition from working for someone else mm -hmm. to working for yourself so tell us about that which one came first was it the apartment and then the school or the school then the apartment okay the, the school um came first okay okay um so tell us that story uh, okay this is what happened so um as i said we're planning to go back <laughs> after my, my my wife had finished okay but it so happened that when my wife was done with her studying, we actually went back. Okay. okay. And Wait, the, both of you went back to Zambia? Yeah, all of us. With okay. my, by kids. the time we had two kids. Okay. And so we went back, but I had not quit my job. It was in December. Like, okay. And my plan was to come back in January, work mm -hmm. until March, then quit my job, 
hand over the apartment and go back to Zambia. Okay. okay. And but it so happened that my wife couldn't get back to work. Uh, oh. She used the there were problems at her working place. Uh, the, in Zambia. In Zambia, the okay. university was closed, and she had some problems, some issues to do with uh, getting good accommodation. So then she was like um, getting frustrated with mm -hmm. that. And then, so as we were thinking about all that, and I, I also tried to call back my former employer as if I could get back my job. They, they didn't give me a very nice answer. Well, my boss said, yeah, my phone boss said he couldn't promise anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so how long was that? Like, how long were you away from Zambia? It was about five years. Five years. Yeah. And when you went back, how long did you guys stay there for before you came back to Japan? I stayed for about for a couple of weeks, but my family stayed there for three months. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I came back and, yeah. So, uh, and at that time, oh yeah, this is what happened at my workplace. When my boss heard I was going to leave, he didn't want me to leave. Ah, in Japan, yeah. the boss in Japan. Yeah. Okay. He said, just, I want you, because uh, this is, um, he was happy with my work. I had a re re retention for, kids, for students was high. Okay. And he offered me a raise. <laughs> okay. And, uh, well, that helped me have confidence in what I was doing. I, okay. I knew that... Um, uh, then I'm doing something that w works. Mm -hmm. okay, so, but in, so we ha we're in the middle of that. Then I said, "Well, I have a, a job here, and so why don't you just come back?" And of course, there's some other concern that why did if we came here to go to school so that we can support our country? What's the, <laughs> the uh, what's the morality? <laughs> you know? what's, so, but. Um, uh, but it turns out that now looking back, I'm more useful to my country and okay. to my host country. I'm, okay. a, I'm an asset. And mm -hmm. I think I'm several times more useful now. Okay. To so, so could you articulate in what ways for viewers so they understand what you mean? So you're more valuable to Zambia by yep. being here. In what ways would you? Okay. Right now I have a program trying to help the education system, especially primary education in okay. Zambia. Last year I, held, I went back home, I had a workshop where I was training teachers okay. and training school owners, private school owners. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I have a, it's a huge program that, that I want to carry out. My okay. goal is to help elementary school education mm -hmm. in Zambia. Okay. And it's kind of um, um, different, because I've actually developed different ways of teaching, and I think differently about education. And I think education should change. So some of the ideas that I've tried that I want to implement in, in, that, in okay. that sense. Yeah. So in that way, um, I think I'm going to have a, a much larger um, contribution to my condition. Mm, understood. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this, so we had to, I had to deal with that issue, although now it's not an issue anymore. Now I wanted to go back, but then we decided anyway that I was going to stay. So I said, why don't you just come back and see? Then we we'll see how things go. So that's how my wife came back. But yeah. at that point, uh, those two, uh, I I had to decide how am I going to uh, do this. So uh, two thousand and two. I decided that I was going to work for three years, mm -hmm. and after that, I, was, I have to be on my own. Ah, oh, I see. And my reasons were, if I have to live here, I want to live a normal life. <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, what I mean by that is, I want to work when I want to work, and the kind of work that I want to do, and I want to get a decent place for my kids, for my family to live, and I want to send my children to the schools that I think are good for them. So in order to do that, I, know, I knew I couldn't do that teaching English for somebody else, okay. but I had to do it to be on my own. Because I realized that actually teaching English is, kind of, is quite lucrative like okay. if you know what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's how I decided after three years I was going to be on my own. And so after three years, uh, in fact I'd forgotten that I had, it was, uh, Exactly two years, but I had that goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So, and the, when time came, when I felt I was ready, mm -hmm. it was actually exactly three years. Okay. And before that, this is what I did: was I started to uh, read to learn about different um, subjects that I thought would help me with my career as a teacher, as well as a parent, and as well as a, a business owner. Okay. So I started studying. And when I was working for my previous employer, I went for every 
uh, like the training seminars for teachers. I actually volunteered to participate in some of the events, okay. which many teachers don't, and just to learn about the business, to learn, you know, to learn the ropes and to get myself ready for what I was going to do. So by that time, I had tested a few things and I was thought I knew I was ready. I had, I, I have what I call a three-point validation. Um, um, one is that I have, if I'm doing something for that thing to be really good, somebody has to say it's good. That's one. Secondly, um, results have to show it's good. And the third point is that I have to feel it is good. Mm -hmm. So I had those three. I knew people were saying what I was doing was good, and I saw the results were good, and right. I felt I was, it was good, so I decided I was going to be on my own. Okay. But now here comes a problem. <laughs> um, so you're not a permanent resident at this point. No. Right? So you're, gonna tr you're trying to move out on your own, right. uh, so you need a place, sorry, you need um, all these things, so walk us through it. Okay. So the first thing that happened is the w to get a place. Okay. okay. Um, this ties back in uh, to... The unfortunate incident that happened okay. when my son was born premature. Okay, okay. Um, that was a blessing in disguise. In disguise, <laughs> so of course we, we ha I had to deal with a lot of issues that mm -hmm. time, and of course, like um, my faith helped me go through that. It was a very difficult time, okay. and uh, a lot of fears because the doctor told me the doctors told me that there are possibilities of my son being disabled in many oh. ways. Okay. Um, but thankfully, and God is okay. Okay. In fact, this is one of the things that on later, most of the doctors that he had dealt with or that knew about him were very much interested in his uh, development. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was one time we, uh, his doctor invited us to his holiday home at the Lakeside home in, uh, at the foot of Mount Fuji. And okay. there were 13 specialists, 13 doctors who came to that. And I, I didn't know. And one of them was... Uh, the president of this hospital in which he was born. Okay. And this is a big hospital, the biggest yeah. hospital, children's hospital. So we stayed there for a couple of days and they asked me questions about the development of my kid. Oh, how did he, how is he doing? And they went, oh, he's done very well. And uh, so that connected me to these people. And these are very influential people, very powerful people. Okay. And that was a very important um, key to um, uh, whatever I've done. But two things, so my kid and also the English teaching, okay? English teaching has done some amazing things. Mm -hmm. I've been able to meet people, amazing people, mm -hmm. in the name of teaching them English, okay? And some have really wanted to learn English, like they're preparing f uh, to go for seminars abroad, and uh, they wanted me to help them with the presentation in English. Others have just wanted to have opportunities to just to discuss. Like, one of them was, it turns out to be my son's doctor. Okay. And this, this uh, he's a very well-known doctor, very, people love him. Uh, okay. People come from very far. And turns out he opened his practice the month my son was born. Okay. <laughs> and we didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. So when my son was born, he was three months in the neonatal intensive care unit. So after three months he came, we had to take him home. This was very close to his original uh, expected date of okay. birth. So when we moved out, the social worker from the city was following up and then she came one day and she says, okay, I'm going to introduce you to an English-speaking pediatrician. And it turns out to be Dr. Aguchi. Okay. And uh, so we went to see him and uh, so he was looking to see my son and then he said, okay, can you teach me English? <laughs> he was a fluent speaker of English because he, he studied for uh, two years in in, 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 in the UK, uh, no, the, in the United States, so mm -hmm. he used a fluent speaker. But okay. what that turned out, what, that hap what happened that time was, uh, the lessons we we'll just discuss, and then in the process we discovered that we had a common passion, <laughs> okay, ah. that was towards children, he loves children, mm -hmm. and his, to, a lot of people come to his clinic, children with developmental dis uh, problems, children with disabilities. And, and when my son was growing up uh, between the ages of, when it was, uh, from the time it was one until six, we had to go to this hospital regularly for it. They had to go to follow him up. And do, he had some other, he, he had to go through some therapy okay. of some sort. So in the process, I used to meet these other children that had all kinds of disabilities. And since the doctors had told me that there's a possibility that my son would have a disability, mm -hmm. so I became very much interested. In fact, they gave me books to read about okay. 
So, and so in the process, I, I learned a lot about that. And with that, I developed interest in helping out. Because I asked myself a question. I said, if, what if my son became like one of these children? What would I want him to do? Mm -hmm. uh, where would I want, want to take him? So from, I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to accept in my school any child. Okay. And when I told, we talked about this, she said, oh, yeah, let's do that. So we started having, I was having kids with, he, he helped, he, he let me. Peter, he's a pediatrician, right? Yeah, he's a pediatrician. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not just an ordinary one, by the way, he's quite an authority. Okay. With, uh, in, and like what they call PDA, that's the problem my son had when he was born. Before children are born, there's a whole at, on, on the heart, which mm -hmm. connects to the mother, which has to close. But he okay. was born too early for that to close. Okay. So they had to get that to close. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was a, an amazing miracle because uh, the, the treatment for that is one, they give medication. They give medication, and if it doesn't work, then they do a blast blood in, uh, transmission, okay. uh, trans, transfusion. Okay. And after that, if that doesn't work, then they go to surgery. So my son went to the, through the first and the second stage and it didn't close. So we, we had to go for the third. And it was so tiny. It's not surgery. Wow. So we get everything ready, and you're supposed to go to go surgery on a Monday. But once on that Sunday, we go to the hospital, and the doctor comes and says, Oh, the thing has closed. Oh, wow. So you don't need to go for surgery. So thanks. Wow. Oh, my God. Okay, thanks. so that's another miracle. Yeah. Okay. So, but because of those things, so I had to, when I met Dr. Oguchi, he's a, an authority in those areas. We had a very strong relationship because of this passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as we started talking, so I wonder, he, he just, uh, uh, I, I suggested, said, why don't we have a Christmas program for kids? And we, he said, oh, yeah, that's a very good idea. He sponsored everything 100% and got all the staff of his clinic to do the thing, to publish it and everything. We had to have two sessions because we had too many people. people. Okay. And during that meeting, he introduced me to the people. He said, this is Simon, and he's going to start his English school here. Please sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and he let me use one of the rooms in his clinic. Uh, by that time, I was still working. Uh, okay. Uh, so I had to use, I could use that once a week on mm -hmm. Friday, so okay. that's how I built So it was within the clinic before you got your uh, your actual spot within the building? Within the building, yes. Okay. Uh, to the, he was on the fifth floor, and that was, room was on the third. Okay. So, it's about, so I started from there. And okay. So I started building uh, my student, uh, you know, uh, the number of students on the side using that program. And the number of students was increasing. Okay. So then, the time came when the, the time when I was thinking of quitting, I was going to. I had a few students, and I had to take a leap of faith, though, because okay. it wasn't enough. Uh, it, the, the, the I didn't have enough, mm -hmm. and it's I would do that because of the income that I had. I'd scaled down my work from full time to part time okay. while building this site. Okay. So I had like a certain amount of money that I needed. So, but then I couldn't make more money this side unless I let go. Okay, so that the catch on it too. Right. Okay. That is the situation. So I had okay. to take a leap of faith, and uh, it turns out that by the time I was uh, ready, uh, by the time I was, but I had enough students. Okay, so by the time you made the decision to leave, you had enough students to sustain you. Yeah, and but this, it, although uh, it was like this, so they, when we try, when when uh, the doctor helped me, tried to help me get a place in the building, they said they had no place. Okay. So they gave me, they let me use their conference room on Saturday. Okay. So which meant it was a bigger, and I could hire it the whole day, mm -hmm. from ten to five. So I had like four classes. Okay. And then. Um, as students, as we kept doing, then I, the doctor went again to ask them if there was room, and they said there was no room. They kept going until one day, they came back and said, "Oh, actually, we are moving from the fourth floor, so he could have the whole of it." And this is a, there are five companies now. Okay, <laughs> that oh, floor wow. says he can have the whole of this, mm -hmm. the whole of this, and then uh, they cleared it, so. Then they came back to I said, no, I don't, I don't have, I want, I would love to have it, but 
You don't have the resources for it. I don't have the resources. I don't have enough students. Yeah. So they say, okay, well, how much room do you want? So I stood and said, can you build a wall here? So they built a wall and they had this one big room where I could hold classes. So I started. Okay. And by that time, I, I still didn't have PR. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so you weren't a permanent resident yet, no, right? no, but I was still working you're with making that, but, your way. Yeah, but one thing I did though was I declared my income all the time. Okay. I signed up for this um, organization that helps uh, um, uh, small businesses okay. and individuals to do their taxes. Okay. And what that does is if you get a stamp, you get a, um, a ribbit, 100,000 okay. yen ribbit. Okay, what's the time. company called? It's called... Uh, there are two ways of uh, doing your taxes. There's yeah. the blue form or the white form. Okay. So this is the blue one. This is more professionally done. Okay. And the white one's for very like um, small businesses. And okay. the, but when you do this and you get this stamp, you get hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And if you use the software, you get six hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Uh, not dollars, sorry. One hundred yen. One hundred thousand yen. Mm -hmm. And if you do. Uh, the software, you use the software, mm -hmm. you get 650,000 ribbit. Okay. Uh, so, and they helped me go through that. Mm -hmm. So I have, one thing that I did was to make, sh to keep my records. I have my records, I think, from the first day I got my income in Japan. Okay. So for uh, all the years. Yes. I have the spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do my taxes. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the only official document I had to present to anyone who uh, uh, wanted to know about my income. So, but I made sure I did the taxes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and then, so the time came when I was supposed to, when I, I planned to quit. And I, I, before that, a few, about um, a few months before, about eight months earlier, I had applied for permanent residence. Okay. Yeah. But when I went to, that was in 2005, I went to the immigration office. And they told me, but you've just been here for eight years. So mm -hmm. in order to apply for permanent residence, you need you need to have uh, to have been here for ten years. Okay. Then I asked the lady, I said, but is it impossible? We said, well, it happens sometimes to get. And then I said, can I apply? Is it okay for me to apply? I said, well, but she insisted it's very unlikely. But I mm -hmm. said, can I? So I applied. Okay. So and I was banking on that. From my calculations, I thought by the time it's March of 2006, permanent residence should be in. Should be in. Mm -hmm. okay. But what happened was it wasn't in. Okay. okay. But then I said, okay, since I still have a few months on my visa, maybe let me wait. But I had already resigned, so I quit anyway. And uh, so March comes, I quit and say goodbye to once here. Mm -hmm. And then in April, something happened. When I was there, I realized that my daughter's visa was expiring in May. Okay. Okay. And I needed to apply it for the renewal of the visa. And with, if I have a work visa, I needed a letter from the employer. Mm -hmm. And you had already quit your I'd job. I had already quit. And if I had realized, if I had seen that before I quit, I was going to push that before I quit. Right? Yeah. But then I didn't. Mm -hmm. I never knew until this time. Yes. I went, wow, what's this? <laughs> I mean, I was scared. I was I can understand. They then, so what I did was, I went to the immigration anyway. The senior uh, official, officer came over mm -hmm. and so he asked me the questions. Um, uh, he said, but so how do you live here? Uh, how do you um, support, learn, yourself. support yourself? So mm -hmm. I said, I have this number of students. Okay, he said, okay, you go, just write down the number of students you have and how much you get your income, and I think you asked for some proof of that. And also, um, uh, where you have your, your, your students. Mm -hmm. So I, I went home and I just did it. I wrote that on an A4 sheet of paper. Okay. And I went back. And uh, so they approved my, they gave my daughter the visa. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that again is like another miracle. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Anyone tries that, but this yeah. is something that happened. Yeah, because it's unlikely. To, it's very unlikely. It, well, it, it's something that's, that was my personal experience. Okay. And then I had to do that like five times. Okay. Yeah. So for all your kids plus yourself and your wife? Yeah, and then plus when I was, because um, what happened was I had to reapply from a permanent residence. Okay, because it was denied. <laughs> because what happened is then I got a response later 
it was a negative response. Okay, was it the same year? Yeah, this, uh, soon after I'd gotten my daughter's renewal. Renewal. Okay. It's, yeah. Was there a reason for it, or they just said like no, and that's it? Okay, I don't remember quite, but but I think they had said that that I needed to have been here for ten years. Okay. Yeah. So I said, well, I wait, and when it's ten years, I'll reapply. Okay. Okay. So that was two thousand and six, mm -hmm. and then. And the same year, what happened was around October, uh, you know, I, I talked about the room that I, I, I started renting. Okay. Uh, was it the one that was in the clinic downstairs or the one on the fourth floor? On the fourth floor, the new okay. one, which okay. they so, just okay. built for me now. Okay. So um, that was your first official spot? That's, that was my first okay. official spot. And the thing about that was, you know, it was, they completed it and they did everything before I knew how much I was going to pay for okay. rent. Okay, so when they're done and they were like a month early, they told me to move. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can move, it's ready. And then we'll talk about the contract later. So I started using it before I knew how much I was gonna pay oh, wow. and how much the contract was worth. So then the time came, but for, by that time, I already had the money. In fact, if they had told me, <laughs> Earlier, you I, didn't, the money. Uh, I didn't have the money yet because <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for this money from the students. Mm -hmm. So by that time, by the time they asked me to go and sit in the, um, the, the, the um, CEO's office and um, um, others that were there, and the real estate agent was, was there, and the doctor was there, mm -hmm. and they asked me, they, for the first time, I knew how much I was going to pay. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> then I said, so, oh, yeah, when do you want me to pay? And oh, yeah. Okay, fine, because I knew I, I was I would be ready that time. Okay, so so did you know Japanese at this point? Okay, yes, it's a very important thing actually, uh, mm -hmm. which I almost forgot. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to share your story or have us visit your region, send us a message on any of our social media platforms or via our website. That's good.